When it comes to game franchises, the Tales of series has never been one on many people's radar. It's a series near and dear to my heart, with lovable characters journeying through anime-style worlds, essentially making them playable shonens. And with most games taking place in their own worlds with unique casts, each entry could easily be someone's first Tales game. For me, that was the 3DS port of Tales of the Abyss. Despite its 25-year history and its uniqueness in its real-time action RPG approach, the Tales series has largely been considered mid-tier, especially compared to more mainstream franchises like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. Tales of Symphonia helped the franchise catch on in the West, and yet while its popularity outside of Japan has been steadily increasing, Tales has yet to be truly seen and respected as a top-tier AAA property. Now, for me personally, the brand prestige is not nearly as important as whether or not people just genuinely love the games. Graphically speaking, the series has never really been something to write home about, but I was always more focused on the characters' journeys and dynamics with each other. Sure, Tales of Berseria might look like a really polished PS2 game ported to PS4, Okay, all I really care about is helping Velvet kill the Pope. Hashtag BA do crime. And likewise, Tales games have never been really known for their plots, save for a few select games like Symphonia, Abyss, or Berseria, but they're always delivering on their casts. They might seem like generic anime archetypes at first, but when you spend enough time with them, you truly get to love them as people, and especially their dynamics with each other. You get to see them save the world together and just do mundane things together, like talk about what they like to cook or what their personal dreams are. If you're truly sorry, do the Squirrel Karina for me, the fluffy version. There's a Squirrel Karina? There's a fluffy version? And generally speaking, I also just really appreciate how diverse the casts are and how usually it's a nice even split between men and women. Genuinely, this franchise has some of the best female characters that I've seen in media. Um, the gals are always my favorites. <laughs> And yet, after Tales of Berseria's release in 2016, the series publisher and developer Bandai Namco sought to take the Tales series to the next level. They wanted to make it a spectacle, to evolve the franchise into something more accessible, more glamorous, and clearly of the level of recent Final Fantasy titles. Their aim was to overhaul the franchise's perception so as to appeal to a wider audience, especially outside Japan, without alienating existing fans. And so in 2016, work began on Project Arise. The name is a nod to the two major themes of the game, Inheritance, so as to honor all the Tales games that came before, and Evolution, which would take the best elements of all of them and forge them into something new. While its essence as a Tales game would remain intact, it would receive a complete makeover. The Arise staff, comprised of newcomers such as producer Yusuke Tomizawa, who'd only worked on the definitive edition of Tales of Vesperia, as well as series veterans like art director and character designer Minoru Iwamoto. Oh, and of course, the illustrious composer Motoi Sakuraba, because this man literally lives and breathes tales. <laughs> Like seriously, I'm, I'm worried for this man. Is, is he okay? Is he sleeping? Is anyone in the games industry sleeping? Probably not. From the get-go, there was a vision for this game to be an epic, to astound the player with an incredible scope and a new art style which would reflect the prestige the developers were aiming for. While Tomizawa stated that Arise would not be open world, it is easy to see how many people thought that it would be, given the level of detail and polish put into all of the environments, as well as the whole angle of the twin worlds, Dana and Rena. This game also has a lot of nods to older Tales games. Um, it tries to play the story and premise pretty safe to keep that mainstream appeal. Again, the whole twin world concept is something a lot of Tales fans are familiar with. It shows up in a lot of other Tales games like Tales of Symphonia or Tales of Zillia. You know, usual themes of duality, coexistence, harmony, getting the fuck along. You know, that thing we can never manage in the real world. That all said, Arise never really hooked me as it was being discussed through its development. It's not that I thought the game sounded bad, but rather that nothing about the project 
viscerally spoke to me the way that previous Tales games had. Not to mention that at the time I was still very much in the throes of Velvet Crow's journey in Tales of Berseria, and with that game's story having destroyed my heart and put it back together many, many times over the years, and also this year I, I went back to it and it destroyed me all over again. Arise, for the most part, had become irrelevant to me. Tales of Arise was initially meant to be released in 2020 for the series' 25th anniversary, but had to be pushed back due to numerous issues to do with the game's immense scope, the added complexity of developing the game for next-gen hardware like the PS5 and Xbox Series X or S or whenever it's called, <laughs> letters, and uh, Miss Rona, of course. She just had to ruin everything. It was eventually released on September 10th, 2021 on PC, PS4, PS5, and whatever the hell the Xboxes want to call themselves. And thankfully for Namco, their efforts seemed to pay off. Reviews for Arise were glowing across the board, and by April 2022, the game had sold over 2 million units, basically blowing every other Tales game out of the goddamn water. Evan the chat for Braceria. With many players citing this as their first ever Tales game, which does make me very, very happy. While it does seem to be fan consensus that the writing is not the game's strong point at all, especially in the quote-unquote second half, the presentation and gameplay have been highly praised as a solid step up from previous entries. Yeah, yeah, I'm in that camp. <laughs> I didn't get around to playing Arise until a few months ago. I had been curious about it, but one day came across an in-depth video by Elixir Vitae Games about her thoughts on Arise. Highly suggest y'all check it out because she's where I learned a lot of interesting details about this game's development. And in general, I really appreciate her very chill, laid-back analysis when it comes to the characters specifically. Also the music, she, she's a music girly. Her video is what convinced me to give Arise a try, especially when I discovered a cheap physical copy on Amazon. Now how can I say no to that? As I played the game initially, I found myself really loving it. I was absolutely enthralled by the game's presentation and atmosphere. And while this cast still isn't one of my favorites, I did appreciate the work that went into them and their dynamics with each other, which kind of just goes to show how high the bar is for the series' character writing in the first place. The story... Mm, it was fine, it was serviceable, but the characters were the thing that were keeping me going. I could notice a lot of issues with the world building and the way the story was being told as I was going, but I just loved the characters way too much to let that stop me. But as I approached the end, I couldn't help but feel hollow. The polished illusion had worn off and beneath that shiny veneer, I kept noticing more and more problems when it came to the story because, oh dear Renesalma, that final act though. <laughs> Ultimately, Tales of Arise is a game that I deeply respect for its ambition. I love so many aspects about this game, in particular the way that it uses design to communicate its story. And in general, it's just so much fun to play, especially compared to previous Tales games. They did such a good job leveling up the environment design, the art design, the gameplay. It really does feel like an evolution. But as more cracks began to form in the story, I couldn't help but feel that ambition betrayed a neglect for many aspects of the game's story and world building, which do make it genuinely difficult for me to return to. Because ultimately, these games are about their characters and their stories. They're interwoven with each other. Especially for me personally, gameplay can enhance a story, but I'm mostly here for story. Berseria's environment design and gameplay are ugh, kind of bleh as you go back to it, but the story genuinely gets better every time I go back to that game, and it keeps me coming back. Arise is not bad by any means at all. If anything, it's essentially a glorified tech demo, and a damn good one at that. But it's because of that gnawing feeling of disappointment that I have to make this video. I mean, I don't have to, but you know, I want to, because I like to talk a lot. And so we're gonna dive into the good, the bad, and the downright confusing of Tales of Arise. We'll be doing a recap of the game's story with asides to discuss story elements, character arcs, 
world building details, and more to make this friendly to those unfamiliar with the game or the Tales series as a whole. Naturally, spoilers for Arise and a few other Tales games lie ahead, and some pieces of media that I reference throughout the story, it's just what I do. But don't worry, you'll still be able to enjoy this. So grab a snack, sit back, and relax as I recount to you both the admirable leaps and the pitiful pitfalls of Tales of Arise. Before we begin, ciao! My name's Thomas, aka The Unicorn of War, and I'm an author and YouTuber who makes reviews, video essays, commentaries, and other videos about various pieces of media that I enjoy, particularly animation and now video games, I guess. Wings Club, Avatar and Korra, Fairy Tale, and now the Tales series. And as an author and avid writer, I love analyzing stories and diving into what about them resonates with me and what doesn't. I don't claim to be objective here. If you genuinely enjoy the things that I talk about that I don't enjoy, I'm really happy for you. I am. These are just my personal feelings. You know, art subjective and all that. If any of that sounds interesting to you, then you can subscribe and ring that bell for notifications and also for Tales of Vesperia vibes because YouTube hates creators. And if you're willing and able, you can pledge your support for myself and the channel over on Patreon. $1 patrons get access to my private Discord server, The Union of War, early access videos and shoutouts and video credits. $5 patrons get writing critiques up to 5,000 words and quarterly Q&A videos. $10 patrons get content requests, monthly live stream hangouts, and exclusive video content. And $20 patrons get access to my book stuff, including updates on future books and signed books. You can message me on Patreon for mailing details for signed books. And I'm also working on recording some audiobook stuff, so that'll be fun for you $20 patrons to watch me figure out what the hell I'm doing. Life is one big learning process. We're all constantly learning. Now, without further ado, let the shit show begin. Our story begins on the fantasy world of Dana. In the sky hangs its twin world, Rena, a planet said to be home to the gods and a resting place for the dead. This opening cutscene, narrated by a character we'll meet later on, serves to introduce the player to the setting. It's designed to communicate the conflicts that run through the whole game, along with a brief summary of the history that led to those conflicts. In that sense, it's not unlike the opening monologue of Avatar The Last Airbender, where Katara sets up the war being waged between the Fire Nation and the rest of the world. Because, let's be real, the Atla opening monologue is like the benchmark for all opening monologues. In ages long past, it was believed that Mother Dana was indestructible and everlasting. Rena, on the other hand, was thought to be the domain of the gods, a paradise where the souls of the departed could rest forevermore. Oh, how wrong we were. <laughs> I'm in danger! We learn the basics of what we need to know here. That one day, a fleet of starships descended from Rena laying waste to Dana. With their advanced technology, as well as genetically modified monsters called Zoogles, silly name I know. Good boy. The Renan soldiers conquered Dana and enslaved its people. 300 years have passed, and Dana has been divided into five realms. The only realm we focus on right now is Orbis Calaglia, a realm of dry, barren wastelands, subject to sandstorms and scorching heat. While we do learn about Dana's conquest from this monologue, and a bit about the place our story begins, we don't really get much in the way of the Renans as an enemy, nor the Danans as sympathetic victims or even protagonists. Conflict is all about character. It is the clashing motivations between opposing parties and their dance as they fight for what they're after. That's what really hooks you into whatever story is going on. 
It gives you someone to root for and someone to root against. This opening monologue, while functional, is quite dry. It reads like a lot of openers trying to establish the world as giving you a history without getting you invested in why that history matters. The Danins are a faceless victim to the Renans' conquest, while the Renans at least have the benefit of the visuals of the soldiers and Zoogles, along with a dedicated introduction to the current ruler of Calaglia, Lord Balsef. And yes, his name is quite unfortunate, made worse by the fact he chose it himself. Is he a meme lord? Maybe. It is ruled over by the tyrant Balsef, Lord of the Firemaster Corps. That is disgusting. Ew. But we don't have a real sense of the players here beyond enslaved laborers and colonizing invaders. The Danon people toil as slaves. Day after day they suffer under the ruthless oppression of the Renan soldiers with only one hope of escape. Death. Oh, really? <sighs> that sucks. This, uh... Again, looking at the opening monologue for Avatar, it's quite similar with the Fire Nation waging war against the Air Nomads, Water Tribes, and Earth Kingdom. Where it differs, however, is in introducing recognizable characters, a sense of escalating stakes, and a goal, a hope. Katara identifies herself as the narrator. She is from one of the Water Tribes who have suffered at the hands of the Fire Nation, whose father has left to fight against them. She tells us that the Fire Nation is nearing victory in the war, meaning the situation has become dire. This very intentionally comes with the implication that she, her family, and her home are all in grave danger. She also tells us about the Avatar, a powerful, legendary figure who can wield all four elements, and the only person who can stop the Fire Nation. The stakes escalate at the mention of his mysterious disappearance 100 years ago. So now there's this sense of dread, yet this soft-spoken hope that the Avatar will return and put an end to this war. Suddenly, the conflict has become more personable and more human, it's become real. We are sitting there, hoping alongside Katara that the Avatar will come back to save the day. Translation, you give a fuck. Congrats. You're emotionally invested, bitch. Arise, by contrast, gives you only one face. The tyrant who did not even start the invasion, and arguably the least important villain in the entire game. The tyrant Balsef. Dude couldn't even make it into the anime intro, that's how unimportant he is. <gasps> and while it's clear the Danans are suffering as slaves, there's no real sense of urgency when it comes to defeating the Renans, nor is there any character presented as having skin in the game. Even our narrator does not reveal his identity, despite the fact that he actually turns out to be one of the best written characters here. So while the opening monologue isn't bad, it just is not as engaging as it could have been. And even knowing the rest of the game's story, there are a lot of details here that are missing, such as the crown contest or even the battle between the five lords. That could be easily used to give the player something to latch onto, and even be extrapolated as amplifying the dangers faced by the Danans as their suffering is used by the lords to attain the title of sovereign. And we definitely needed someone on the home team here to have faces to the people that we're supposed to be rooting for, so that we can do more than just feel sorry for them as a faceless mass as they toil and die under Renan rule. Another faceless mass. Aside from that one guy. Bullshit. That one guy who doesn't matter. <laughs> We could explain how their labor is used to gather energy for the Renan Lords and in turn better establish the concept of astral energy, which is essentially this game's term for life force. Maybe we could have mention of some certain Danon hero from ages past who led a resistance against the invading Renans, only to fall in battle and become a mere myth. Could make us wonder who could be the next hero to follow in their footsteps in the present day. Even the attempt by Renans to erase their story story could signal how they attempt to stamp out the culture of the indigenous Danans, only for select Danans to defy their oppression and make it a point to preserve their stories and legends with each other. And moreover, while we hear about Rena, we don't properly establish Lenigus. You mean the same Lenigus that's up in the sky? I've heard it called the Renan's Castle. But I never imagined people actually lived up there. It never gets done in the rest of the game either, aside from one missable skit, which 
is still pretty vague, so we might as well mention it here. See, the Renans don't actually live on Rena. It's a bit of a misnomer. They live on an artificial moon orbiting Rena, a floating fortress called Lenigus that they created. No one ever questions why none of the Renans seem to live on their home world, though. And while there is a reason for it, the lack of a stronger establishment creates confusion for the players when they go, wait, what the hell is a Lenigus? What the hell is a Weedenfruder? <laughs> and also kind of makes the characters look cartoonishly oblivious as they go, well, we were taught to never question why none of us come from the mother world. Even Shion's comment of, where did you think we all lived? I never imagined people actually lived up there. Well then, where did you think we all lived? Um, I don't know, Rena? <laughs> this also could have begged the question, what did the Renans do to their own world that they all had to move to an artificial moon? It could explain why they colonized Dana, potentially to exploit their resources after they destroyed their own world. While the truth of that matter is quite far off from that conjecture, you could still have the audience believe that so that they have a more solid grasp of the story for most of the game, and then rip the rug out from under them when they uncover the truth later on. Right now, it's just deep confusion, and that's, that's not what you really want for your audience. Experience. Once we're past the opening monologue, we cut to Mosgul, a small settlement in Calaglia. We're immediately struck with the visuals of Danon slaves mining the burning earth while overseen by Renan soldiers. I must say, the oppressive atmosphere is well-crafted. I'm obsessed with the lighting, the red tones, and the flames against the deep blues of the rocks and the black maroon sky. I'm just mad for time. All the cinders and dust floating through the haze, and the image of Rena and Lenicus constantly looming in the sky. Not to mention Lord Balsef's castle towering over the rocks in the distance. The team did a wonderful job with the art design of this game, especially when it comes to environments. Honestly, environment design, art design, they're breaking their backs carrying all this. Previous games, especially since Zillia implemented the over-the-shoulder camera, have suffered in environments feeling very samey, empty, and generic. I remember uh, there was a YouTuber who pointed this out. I cannot remember their name. I will link it right now. Future self, if you fail me, I'll kick your ass. Arise's art direction helps to bring out the beauty of the world. You can feel the exhaustion of the Danon slaves as they mine and collapse, Renan soldiers just looking for an excuse to become violent. It's quite grim, which makes sense, as that was one of the goals when developing Arise, to make the game's presentation match a darker tone, which oddly feels even more angsty than Berseria. And that game starred Velvet Crow, angsty lord of calamity, praise be to her. Only two things matter to me. The taste of blood-soaked flesh and revenge upon one man. Good for her. Every din and realm is aligned with a different element. Water, fire, earth, wind, and light. In this case, Calaglia is where fire astral energy is gathered, hence the arid terrain and all the spontaneous combustion everywhere. Not even sure where those fires in the environment are coming from or what keeps fueling them, but uh... They just there dancing. Why do the fires burn? Probably the same reason that birds fly. It's because they want to burn and for no other reason. This elemental affinity helps to keep each realm visually distinct. It's not as culturally relevant as locales in Avatar, so don't go in expecting that level of detail or world building, but it works well enough. Honestly, it's probably part of the whole glorified tech demo vibe. By having realms that go to extremes in terms of elements, it allows the designers to create wild environments to push their newfound technical capabilities to the limits. You know, see what they're capable of for future titles. The Danon slaves are assumedly being made to mine resources for the Renin soldiers. You're probably wondering why, if the Renins are so advanced technologically, they would even rely on slave labor. Well, the truth which gets revealed in a little while is that they aren't actually after any of Dana's resources. All they want is astral energy, 
the life force of all living things. They're harvesting the astral energy that sleeps inside all matter in life forms. And they're doing it the same way they have for the past 300 years using us Danans as mere siphons. They harvest that from the Danans, as when they're made to exhaust themselves through manual labor, their bodies release astral energy. The little silver things in their hands are called spirit cores. They collect the astral energy of the Danans, then send it off to a spirit vessel over in the Renan Lord's castle for collection, which then in turn is stored in that Lord's master core. Any astral energy collected passes through a spirit vessel on its way to being stored in a master core. So, starts with Dan and Slave working, breaking their backs. They release astral energy. Astral energy goes into the spirit core in their hand. That energy goes from the core to the spirit vessel over in Yon Palace, and from the spirit vessel into the master core that belongs to the Lord. Got it? You, you got all that figured out? Okay, remember that. Remember all of that. So ultimately, it is by breaking the spirits of the Danans and exhausting them physically that the Renans get what they're after. Admittedly, the spirit vessel part kind of makes it more convoluted than it needs to be, but... It checks out and ends up being kind of necessary for a plot point later. It even works if you want to interpret all this as, say, the commodification and consumption of the self? The advent of bullshit jobs because we've been so alienated from the fruits of our own labor, we instead fixate on working for work's sake. Hmm. The thing I don't quite get is the missed opportunity to properly establish the sci-fi elements. While I quite like how ridiculously grandiose the designs for the Renan soldiers are, they scream more traditional fantasy than sci-fi, which is odd given the soldiers came here in starships in the opening monologue. This would be a great opportunity to showcase the advanced technology used to subjugate and survey the Danans, yet all we see them use are batons for when they want to do a violence. This might just be because of how recent discussions of how technology can be used to subjugate us and undermine democracy. Heh. <sighs> but it feels kind of odd how we don't see more of the Renan's technology being used in that kind of way. Barriers to control where the Danans can go at any given time, tracking devices so that they can't get away, drones patrolling the area recording everything, ones that could potentially use facial recognition to, I don't know, target Danans perceived as a potential problem or threat, or even rebels in disguise whose identities are all kept in a big database. Advanced societies like Rena and Lenicus probably would be militarized surveillance states given how authoritarian and brutal they are. So why not use those on the people that they've colonized and subjugated? Definitely could have taken some notes from sci-fi dystopias like Blade Runner or Cyberpunk. Or hell, even like the old classic Star Wars movies like Girl. They're right there. I need to rewatch New Hope. That shit was so good. I mention all of this because it's important to establish these things about your world and story early on so that your audience knows what they're getting into. I've heard a lot of people express they were deeply confused when all the sci-fi elements started slamming them in the face in the final act. I also have been replaying the game both on my own and with a friend. She's a casual fan of a lot of things, you know, that we're both into. So I tend to use her thoughts as a benchmark for how well information is conveyed to the average viewer. And in her case, yeah, the, the whole sci-fi part of the sci-fi fantasy fusion was not at all well established or reinforced. So much so that she started cackling when a whole ass flat screen TV started playing in what looked like a traditional lantern lit fantasy tavern or or and this just happened today earlier today when we were hanging out we were in the little quarry uh in the Elden Men and Sia arc and there are these little generators throughout you know the quarry don't know what the hell they do but you know they're just there they're not even plugged in in anything they're just going and she kind of cackled seeing them seeing these sci-fi ass generators that just run on their own power doing lord knows what glowing like neon sci-fi green in the middle of a fantasy quarry <laughs> just oh my god it's funnier than it should be this is what happens when you don't properly establish things very early on and you just drop elements that don't go together randomly like halfway into your story I, 
my god. As we watch the Danon slaves toiling away, a young boy named Cole is made to push a giant barrel. Naturally, his weak nerd arms make this impossible, and when a Renan soldier gets pissed and tries to strike him, some weird buff dude in a goofy mask steps in to protect him. Before the soldier can do any more harm, he ambles off to do eh, problematic things elsewhere. Cole refers to the man as Iron Mask, pointing out that he's bleeding where the soldier struck him, much to Iron Mask's surprise. We need to get you looked at by Doc! That bad, huh? Better safe than sorry, I suppose. Iron Mask goes to see Doc, the local Danon medic, and it's here we get some handy dandy exposition. You see, Iron Mask has amnesia. Oh lord. Usually when a protagonist has amnesia, it's used for the same reason that others are from the quote unquote normal world and then yeeted thusly into a fantasy world to have an excuse for other characters to yeet exposition and world building at them because otherwise they, and more importantly the audience, would have no clue what the fuck is going on at any given moment. Exposition is not bad, it's all about how you do it. Again, Avatar, master class in exposition. He's called Iron Mask because when he was found about a year ago by the other Danons, he couldn't remember his name or past, and he has never been able to remove his mask. To make things stranger, he is unable to feel pain. <laughs> No, literally, his nerve endings are, are shot. They ain't working. They have not clocked in for like a year. Nerve endings are on unemployment. The man cannot feel heat or cold. There is no sting when the soldiers strike him. You get the idea. And no, they never specify where or how they found him. So, uh, write a fanfiction about it, I guess. A lot of Tales protagonists, most of them men, tend to fall into the generic do-gooding nerd archetype. However, when they do, they usually manage to win some points for unique character traits. I've never played Symphonia, but from what I've seen, Lloyd is such a well-meaning doofus that I can't help but root for him. Thanks. Hot, isn't it? Ooh. Yeah, really hot. It's actually iced coffee. Oh, uh, yeah, of course it's cold. Ooh. I lied. It's actually hot. Ooh. Saray is a total gay dork and ruin nerd, so he's officially still in my heart. Saray, let's go hunting for babes. Ah, <sighs> that sure was therapeutic. Why don't you guys step in as well? You mean like this? That's not the kind of babe hunting I'm talking about! Huh? You know, despite the weird Jesus-y undertones, that's, uh, that's a whole other video for another time. Iron Mask, whose name I am hiding for right now because I can and I like to mess with you, doesn't really get those same defined traits, unfortunately. That's not to say he's dull or anything. I love Iron Mask, mostly because he's just such a goddamn himbo, especially once the party's assembled. He cares about people and he's a total sweetheart, and his interactions with the leading lady we'll meet later on, they give me life. It's kind of nice to have a masculine male character who's also so adorably loving and affectionate. It is positive masculinity hours up in this bitch, and I'm here for it. It's a bit heavy-handed as Doc points it out, but he's always willing to take on the pain of others, likely because he thinks he can shoulder it, not being able to feel the pain himself. But as we'll see, this tends to lead him to overestimating how much he can handle. He's the kind of guy who takes on literally everyone's problems until he's drowning in them, yet he can't help it. He genuinely wants other people to be happy and cannot stand the suffering he and his fellow Danans endure day in and day out, questioning why everyone else is just going along with it. Danans are always dying, and the Renans just watch. How long can this continue? Why doesn't anyone stand and fight? Now, normally I'd say this feels contrived, given it's another case of using his amnesia to drive a point home easily, but I guess I can forgive it since it feels like he's still relatively new to this life. Well, half forgive it, because it's been a year, Iron Mask. <laughs> it's been a year! And it also emphasizes the fire in his heart that can't be quenched no matter how hard he tries. How many Berseria references do you think I can sneak in here? He's passionate, he's essentially got no filter, and it's easy to spark him into action. I found some interesting details about Iron Mask that changed during development, one of which being that he was initially gonna have more 
violent tendencies. Fitting, given his entire vibe with his later design was inspired by a mix of Dark Souls and Game of Thrones, this zest eerily <laughs> feels like a relic from that scrapped aspect of his character, and honestly, I am happy about that. Lord knows this cast can be melodramatic enough without another party pooper, but we'll get there later. The thing that I can't get, though, is that the Renans just don't think it's odd he just showed up one day? Again, they need the Danon slaves as manual labor to fulfill their goals, which means they have plenty of incentive to keep track of how many Danons are still alive, how many died over in that ditch over by the mines last Tuesday, and whether any have escaped. Hell, they even keep like regimens for what duties they're on, like, So I've got business with the freight train today, huh? Great. I, they, you'd need a cataloged list for that. Hello? That'd probably work in tandem with the idea of the sci-fi tech if they did have databases for all the slaves to, you know, ensure they were keeping track of them all. That would especially stand out if this new guy just waltzed in from who the hell knows where with this weird ass mask on him? He stands out like a sore thumb and you think pissy Renan soldiers looking for any reason to be assholes would take the first opportunity to be awful to him, especially if he's jumping in the way to protect other slaves constantly. And the Danans seem to have, you know, a good idea of who he is. He's pretty famous among them. Seems like I know more about you than the other way around, Mr. Iron Mask. Is it true you can't take that thing off? You telling me none of the Renans have caught on? None of them? Not one? No? Even more so realizing he never got a spirit core embedded in his hand, meaning they're not getting any of the astral energy he produces. So like, you're wasting your time making him do shit for you. Iron Mask later says that the guards tend to leave Danons alone so long as they keep their heads down and work, since they're not allowed to kill Danons without any good reason, given it defeats their goal of extracting astral energy. But again, we just saw Iron Mask saving a boy from a soldier so I doubt he's usually keeping his masked face down. First impressions are betraying the slay low strategy he's espousing, I'm just saying. Don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. It's also suggested that the mask, given how it seems advanced enough to let Iron Mask not die while he's wearing it, and also refuses to unglue itself from his face, could very well be Renan tech. Iron Mask is horrified at the idea of potentially being a Renan, but it never gets investigated any further. No Renans ever go, Hey, why do you have our tech on your face? And I just think that's a real missed opportunity to let him investigate why the hell this stupid thing is hiding his beautiful face. And you know what? I will be annoyed by the fact that Iron Mask is acting brand new. You have been here for a year, a year, and you have not caught on to anything that works here? Y I, oh my God. <laughs> it feels like this world just came into existence yesterday. Actually that does tackle my next point. Um, <laughs> all of this combined adds to this larger problem where it feels like this world literally just came into existence yesterday. A lot of contrivances alongside glaringly strange plot points that go unquestioned by characters make it harder to buy that this world was existing before the story began. And because of that, it becomes harder to follow along since the world feels less like a living, breathing place and more like a dollhouse. Perhaps that was part of the intent, given how the end of the game goes, but you have to ask whether or not that approach, intended or not, was worth it. And honestly, I don't think it was worth it, especially if it risks hampering investment early on. If you want that strange sense of things being artificial, behold Hereditary, one of my favorite horror movies and one of my favorite movies in general. It literally opens with a dollhouse that seamlessly transitions to the house of the family that we are following. And a lot of it was filmed on a soundstage with propped up walls to imitate the dollhouse vibes. All of those play into a lot of themes in that movie to do with fate, autonomy, and facades. It signals to you early on that there is a clear intent for this strange artificial feeling. It doesn't confuse you as you go along, it just makes you very intrigued. Like these people, these places, are all being crafted and guided by some unseen puppet master. But Arise is not communicating those things at all. It's just, it feels like it was written in, in a weekend, in a first draft, and it never got revised. Whew. Also, and admittedly this is 
very much a nitpick, I will admit that, but I'm gonna scream about it anyway. I have no clue how the hell this Dignus sees or eats through that goddamn mask. Yes, it's acknowledged later on in a few skits, but like, it's so distracting. Can you even see out of that thing? Like, at all? Of course I can. How else do you think I manage to avoid tripping everywhere I go? And I mention that because, while it might not seem like a big problem, it adds to this list of little things which constantly are breaking my immersion. It's like I'm going in and out, in and out, in and out. <laughs> it is less one giant problem and more a death by a thousand cuts flashbacks picking me up, I get drunk, but it's not enough because the morning comes and you're not my sovereign. That one was for the Swifties, sorry, not sorry. And I'm just gonna bring this up now in case future me forgets to write this in when we get the full backstory reveal. What the hell was the mask even for? Someone had to produce this mask to like achieve these effects, if you know, you know. Someone had to produce this. What was it for? Like, like what was what was the purpose of this? I did the character who like introduced it to Iron Mask just have it handy because it was handed to them by the writers. Like, why why are y'all making masks that are capable of these things? Uh, okay. The next day, Iron Mask is assigned to push a freight train with a few other slaves. Look lively, slaves. Let's see some work around here. No clue why they're pushing this thing, nor if there's anything important inside. Now, this might not seem all that bad since I've already established that the goal of the Renans is not to have the Danans get them resources, but rather to just physically exhaust the Danans through labor that is ultimately useless. The issue is that I, dear viewer, established that for you not the game. Iron Mask is not curious as to why they're doing all of this, which could have been used to, you know, foreshadow the Renan's true intentions. Like, hey, uh, why, why are we moving this? Like, is there anything inside here? And they're like, no. And he's like, but then why are we moving it? And they're like, because we said so. Bitch. Get your fucking ass up and work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. You That's have to, so true. You have to surround yeah. yourself with people that want to work have a good work environment where everyone loves what they do because you have one life. No toxic work environments. So all you get in the moment is just, okay, yeah, sure, let's just do this arbitrary thing. What comes next is a long time Tales tradition. 2D anime cutscenes. Tales games have always relied upon 2D cutscenes for pivotal moments throughout the story, which have been animated by Ufotable since Tales of Zillia. Apparently their studio is actually called the like, UFO Table. However, I have always called them Ufotable. I will continue to call them that. I don't know. Ufotable, the sound of it just makes me think of like, you know, telling you that you are fotable, as in like a photo, as in like a drawing. I don't know. Ufotable runs off the tongue better, and I will continue to say it. And if that bothers you, good. And because we are meeting one of the protagonists, Cue anime cutscenes. You know, not a problem. They're very, very pretty. They've always been pretty. Thank you, Ufotable. The only issue is the disconnect between this scene and the one that came before it. It follows a train car moving down the tracks at high speed within what looks to be some kind of valley. However, we don't see where this train is in relation to the train car's iron mask was made to move. So it begs the question, wait, where are we right now? Is this the same train? I've seen a few Let's Plays of the game and that actually has come up quite a few times. People are like, wait, is this is this the same train? And I'm like, ooh, that is jarring. That's very jarring. I remember it kind of confused me the first time. It's not, it's not the same train. This track is actually up on a cliff high above where Iron Mask is right now. No, you can't see it in game. So the train gets blown up with explosives dropped by what appears to be a rebel group led by that narrator from the opening cutscene a man named Zephyr. He sends one of his men, Grenar, to investigate one of the cars. Ooh, that kind of rhymed. And inside finds a woman with pale pink hair who has been chained up. It seems their goal was to find this woman. The young man breaks her free, but when he tries to touch her, she awakens. Thorns of energy leap from her body, and the man screams in pain as he appears to be electrocuted. She escapes, and as Zephyr and the Renan soldiers close in on her, she does what any sane person would. Dramatically leap off of a cliff and disappear into the darkness below. Don't start unbelieving, never do not feel your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna do a flip! You know, it's not too different from what I have her do when I play as her. <sighs> Just continually breaking her legs. Now break your legs. <sighs>
cutting back to Iron Mask and officially back to 3D land, we hear Ren and guards asking the Danons if they have found anything. Which is odd, given these Danons were not sent to investigate anything, just to, you know, push the train cars for no reason. But naturally, Iron Mask senses a disturbance in the force. He climbs up to see the mysterious woman has landed in the train car, and they share a long, long glance with each other. Hey, you're... <laughs> What was that? Okay, James. Iron Mask says, Hey, you're... <laughs> like he's about to say something which would indicate knowing her somehow. That could work with details we discover later on, but it just kind of adds to this sense in the present of what the hell is happening. Anyway, heterosexual meet cute, this man and this woman at eye contact, which means they are now destined to be wed. Look, look, I love these two together, okay? But as a gay, I must take a shot at a modern normativity. Are you confused what that means? Google it. I've been bamboos. <laughs> Anyhow, we have no clue who the hell this woman is, nor why she was imprisoned or is being pursued by the Renan soldiers or the rebels, which for right now, is fine. If they want it to be a mystery that has us asking questions, you know, that's cool. But uh, they will be withholding a lot of information about her for quite a while, potentially even the entire rest of the game. So prepare to build your own head cannons. As the Renan soldiers arrive, completely ignoring Iron Mask as they stare down the woman, Iron Mask gets a scathingly brilliant idea. <gasps> flip the soldiers off the car, run to the front, and get the damn thing moving so he and this lady and some random dude can get the hell out of Dodge. Sorry, it's just you. Oh! <laughs> Initially, I wasn't sure if I liked this, but I think this aligns with his earlier protective drive that led him to jump in to save Cole. It's probably just the mask that makes it difficult to gauge his emotions and therefore motivations. But, you know, this does check out, so... Good on you, do-gooder Iron Mask. But of course, the Renan soldiers catch up with them on the tracks and a fight ensues. Naturally, given this is, you know, an action RPG, you would expect this to be where you start fighting people. But, uh, no. It's just a long cutscene of Iron Mask doing acrobatic dodges. I get that he has no weapon, you know, a real weapon, but you could have had him take one from, you know, a soldier or something. I'm really not sure why this is just a cutscene, as it would be a really great captivating setting to directly involve the player, especially right out the gate. If it's the moving scenery that's the problem, there are tricks to make it feasible. Plenty of older games have had similar scenarios on top of train cars or other moving vehicles, using optical illusions to make it seem the train was moving, when in reality, it's the rest of the environment that was moving around the train, or around where the player character is. I'm not sure why Arise could not do something similar to that. It kind of leaves you with this bewildered disappointment where you're like, fam, am I allowed to play the game yet, or is this essentially just a semi-interactive movie? Side note, while replaying this game to capture footage, I could not help but wonder how exactly Iron Mask pulled off all of these evasive maneuvers. Even knowing his backstory, it does not really make sense to me, and the lack of music as I was recording kind of made it even funnier. In fact, future me. If you would be a darling and insert some deeply ill-fitting music to these escapades for comedic effect, it would be very appreciated. He shakes it off! He shakes it off! Also, I'm really not sure where these tracks lead. I assume they connect to Balsef's castle, hence why the woman was on here to begin with. In which case, when Zephyr arrives, you would think he'd be like, Dude, you're literally just getting us closer to the enemy's stronghold. It kind of just adds to this feeling of disconnection throughout the area, where things just kind of sit around in a nebulous space, and there's no real sense of how they all weave together to make the world, which we will get back to. Now, the way this ends is very confusing. Nath, one of Zephyr's men, disconnects the back two train cars. The middle one is filled with explosive canisters, which... Wait, what? Why are they here? Are they oil drums? Does this fantasy world's tech rely on crude oil or some other explosive substance or fossil fuel? How do the Renans power all their technology anyhow? 
And could that relate to potential exploitation and plundering of natural resources and destruction of the environment? Well, none of that fucking matters, because the answer is just we needed some big dumb explosions, so... The canisters explode. What's in them? Explosions. Yeah, they're canned explosions. Explosions in a can. You can purchase explosive canisters at your local Walmart. But, you know, just make sure not to open them before you get home. Because, you know will explode the store. I need this now. Explosions in a can. So the middle car stops dead in the middle of the track with the guard's car slamming right into it and causing a metric shit ton of explosions. Ah! Hmm. I wonder if you can get a refund on cans you didn't mean to explode. Zephyr's group on the front car, still moving, jumps off to escape. We don't see where they're jumping to, but the angle makes me think that they're jumping off the front which, um, wouldn't you just get hit by the car immediately? And the second they jump, it awkwardly fades to black. So this, this isn't a cliffhanger, it, it, it just ends abruptly. Normally, I would assume that the characters would, you know, see a relatively safe looking landing spot and then dive for it. Perhaps they'd get some scrapes and bruises in the process, but they would be alive. Follow that with our perspective character passing out to, you know, allow for a smooth transition to the next scene. Something that tells us that we're safe and we're likely about to learn more about these rebels. Instead, the scene just ends with like no rhythm. Okay then. Now, nothing too egregious has really happened yet in terms of story, but again, it is a lot of small oddities and inconsistencies that are already adding up. None of these bothered me on my first playthrough, but I can't help but notice more problems with every visit. And even as I'm recording, I'm remembering weird issues. Really, evaluating the quality of a piece of media requires you to experience it multiple times. A good piece of media will age like a fine wine, with you noticing more details about it working well as you continually return to it. But in cases like this, your initial viewing may have blinded you, but the shock is worn off, allowing you to see the problems you probably glossed over the first time. And it'll probably get harder to revisit over time. Like, I notice every time my play arrives, I have less and less of a desire to go back and re-experience it. Whereas with Brissaria, I'm like, take me back. <laughs> I wish to see it again! Following hashtag Traingate, we cut to Balsef's throne room, and he is pissed. You all missed your chance to become lord, which means you lot live and die for me, the mighty Balsef! I assume because he's realizing now that the name he picked out for himself kind of sucks. He lectures his guards, saying that because they missed their chance of becoming a lord, they all have no choice but to serve him. It's a nod towards how Renan society works, but one that just kind of comes off as more confusing than anything else. Especially when our concerns lay with, you know, the mysterious woman who just leapt off a cliff followed by an exploding train a few seconds ago. Getting to the point, he demands the soldiers bring him Xion. Now hurry up and bring me Xion! Yes, yes sir! Giving us a name for the mysterious woman. We don't know why Balsef wanted her delivered to him, but the use of her first name, at least to me, indicates some level of familiarity. That he knows this woman personally and might have an axe to grind. Boo, tomato, 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 I'm throwing tomatoes. But he doesn't. And we're not even told why he's after her, which to me reads as mystery for the sake of mystery. Admittedly, I'm quite jaded on this approach in storytelling because it's often used so writers can get away with giving the audience as little information as possible, instead luring them in and keeping them hooked on the promise that eventually there will be answers and they'll totally be worth you investing a decade's worth of your time. What, I'm not talking about a show about girls with colors. No, I couldn't possibly be. <laughs> In a situation like this, you don't need a mystery. If you give the audience information, it will allow them to understand what's happening and to be invested instead of them being confused over the basic events unfolding before them. So in this case, 
I'll just tell you. Those master cores I mentioned earlier, the ones used by the Renan Lords where, you know, they store all of their astral energy that they steal from the Danans. Well, Shion stole the Fire Master Core from Balsef. We'll get into the problems with this later, but for right now, that's all you really need to know. She took his thingy, and he's mad about it. And on the note of unnecessarily withholding information, we also don't know jack shit about Balsef. Aside from the fact he also goes by Wild Beast. Not sure why. And also that his true name is Erwalzi Teldulis, meaning he absolutely used to be a pipsqueak nerd who got shoved into lockers on the regs on Lenigus. You're welcome for the new backstory that's infinitely better than the sum total of nothing he gets here. Breaking news, Balsef used to be a nerd who deserved his treatment at the hands of dumber, cooler children like Almadria. Oh, we'll get to her. <laughs> now, there has been acknowledgement from the staff that there wasn't much in the way of foundation for the villains. Because of the game's scope, there presumably was not much time to dive into their backstories and characters. All we really get is a subquest towards the end of the game where a bunch of non-voiced NPCs tell us about each Renan Lord, which who will get to, don't you worry. But this lack of understanding for the villains winds up hurting the story a lot in the long run. Since the game hops between different realms with each realm having its own villain, it means we're constantly sending our big bads through a revolving door, leaving them with very little time to establish their presence and build dynamics with the protagonists. Balsaf here only gets two scenes, this one, and then his encounter with Iron Mask and Shion later on when you know, he gets yeeted into another dimension that totally is not the afterlife. Villains and antagonists are vital to a compelling story. They drive the conflict with their actions, and if they're well-written, bring out different sides of the protagonists through challenging them and bringing strife into their lives. All the better if there is a personal connection between them, or if the villain is a foil somehow to what the character believes and stands for, or what they're striving towards. Usually Tales games are pretty good at this with their villains, but Arise sadly falls flat in this regard. Just like everything else, it's a very pretty facade, but there ain't nothing behind it. It's, it's, it's skin deep, girl. I often find myself more impressed with the villains' designs and concepts more than their actual characters. Without much in the way of presence, they don't affect the protagonists all that much, and they don't stick in the player's mind. We don't know anything about Balsef to make us care about him or fear him as a villain, nor to make us concerned for when he inevitably crosses Iron Mask and Xion's paths. That said, I do love his design. The big stocky silhouette, the black armor with pops of gold and crimson, all of the skulls and that weird tail looking thing. Not to mention the giant scar across his face. I get more personality out of the design than I do from Balsef's dialogue or actions, which is gonna be a recurring theme in this game. Once the soldiers vacate, we get an unwanted Zoom call from the neighboring Lord of Cislodia. Ganabelt Valkyris. Someone's in a bad mood. Lord Wolsey, ruler of Orbis Calaglia. Ah, oh, but it's wild beast you prefer, isn't it? Do forgive me. Ganabelt Valkyris. This actually does help to establish the presence of futuristic sci-fi technology used by the Renans, specifically the Lords, but this is the only time that we're ever gonna see it. Not to mention it's the only time we'll ever see the Renan Lords interact with each other and have some kind of, you know, dynamic between them. Unless you count very bad scenes later on, which we will get to. Oh, ooh, ooh, there's so much to cover. It's probably why this video is 700 years long. There's another problem here. Because we're rotating between villains, not only does that mean that individually they don't get enough time to shine, but we never see them acting as a unified force. It very much leaves you with a villain of the weak approach where there's no sense of escalating stakes or a greater threat. I'd much have preferred a meeting of all the lords here, giving us a chance to hear their voices so we can start to wonder what they'll look like or be like when we encounter them later on. We also get mentions about the crown contest from Ganabelt, and we learn that apparently Balsef has attempted and failed to ascend the throne, not once, but twice already. Forgive me, I can only imagine the emotional toll failing to ascend the throne not once but twice must take. A most distressing state of affairs. Shut up! It's none of your concern. 
The crown contest is proceeding apace, and so quickly, I must say. It won't be long before the victor is crowned as the new sovereign. I look forward to it. Balsef's like, third time's the charm, and I'm like, yeah, the bad luck charm. Again, whichever Renin Lord gathers the most astral energy in their master core becomes the sovereign of Rena, specifically the motherland. Five lords, each doing whatever it takes to gather as much astral energy as they can and store it in their master cores. Whichever of them manages to accumulate the most power at the end of their contest is crowned the ruler of the Renin motherland. You know, the motherland that no one lives on. <laughs> Congratulations, you're the king of this barren wasteland. Good luck, girl. You're the king of nowhere. Oh, wait, I think that's a reference to a show I've never watched. Mm. Part of the problem here is that we only get a superficial understanding of the contest and of what sovereign means without any depth to its history. Nor, you know, who's in charge of actually organizing it. Firstly, the crown contest is apparently held every decade. A new crown contest, as they call it, is held every decade or so. Ren and Lords come down from Lenigus and starships and are assigned to Dan and Realm, and in 10 years, whoever got the most astral energy becomes the new sovereign. That seems frighteningly fast to be going through different authoritarian leaders, especially ones with monarch coding. Could be used to foreshadow how strangely fast the turnaround times are, but no one does, so Screw you, I guess. We also don't have any clue as to who is the current sovereign, nor whether they're overseeing the crown contest. Under normal circumstances, the sovereign would likely be the big bad, if not one of the big bads, with the Renan lords as the colonial leaders they have sent off world. You take out the small fry, establishing each lord as a minion who gets progressively stronger, and then finish it off with the sovereign at the very end. However, certain details of the plot make this approach impossible. Not necessarily a bad thing, but in the moment, all of this vagueness and lack of clarity just muddles the waters and makes it difficult to be engaged with the story. Antagonists need motivations as well, and the only character who seems to have a clear motive is the least important antagonist. And no, the clarity of Lanigus government will not become any clear as we go on. In fact, you will receive anti-clarity and you will be left bewildered, befuddled, and bemused. This also leads into another issue, a lack of culture. Renan society is continually stated to be centered on hierarchy and strength. Renans decide who gets more political power and respect based on the power of their astral arts, basically spellcasting, with the strongest usually from long lines of powerful families chosen to be sent to Dana as lords. Strange then, the Sovereign doesn't work by, you know, bloodline or anything. I do find that actually kind of interesting that these powerful bloodlines are constantly fighting each other to produce stronger candidates to become Sovereign. I do like that angle, I just wish it was clear. <laughs> and yet we have no clue about who any of these families are or how they're structured or who are even the people that make up these families beyond just the lords. Nor who the hell these faceless Renan soldiers serving the lords even are. Are they less important family members? Are they commoners from Rena who got drafted or who volunteer? Are they exiles? Who are they? And moreover, while Rena is keen to eliminate any traces of Din in history or culture, they don't seem to have much of either for themselves. A big part of colonization is the colonizing party imposing their cultures, beliefs, and traditions upon the native people whose lands they steal. Again, in Avatar, the Fire Nation colonies are filled with Fire Nation citizens who were relocated onto former Earth Kingdom land, where any remaining Earth Kingdom citizens are second-class citizens with fewer rights and are essentially indoctrinated into Fire Nation culture. So naturally, you would expect the Renans to enforce their own beliefs onto the Danans. What are the religious beliefs of these groups? And how do Renans assert their own while dismissing those of the Danans? Are there particular deities or myths the Renans force upon the Danans? Just in the last game, Tales of Berseria, we saw the Abbey, the antagonistic force, outlawing the worship of the water Empyrean Amanok in Southgand, forcing them to instead pray to their own Empyrean Enominat. It seems so odd that Arise, which took five years to create, would overlook that same aspect when this occupation is the crux of its story. Seriously, did this script get like revised at all in the five years it was being written? We end our scene with Balsif essentially telling Ganabelt, to fuck off. Not sure why Ganabelt even called in the first place, as Balsif implied that 
Ganabelt had some ulterior motive for offering his assistance. What do you want? From what I hear, you seem to be having some trouble over there in Calaglia. As a fellow lord, I merely thought to ask whether I could be of any assistance to you. Enough with the false pretense. I can tell a rat when it's sniffing around. What would he even have to gain? Moreover, how the hell did Ganabel even hear about this? Xion's thievery and escape presumably just happened, so... How did word spread of this to another realm? Did one of the underlings start a rumor? Was this big news on Lenigus with word spreading to all of the Danon realms? No clue, so again, screw you. And it ends with Balsif breaking his weirdly shaped... I... It's not even it's not even a glass, but it doesn't look like a goblet either. It it just looks like a giant cup or like a cap. Anyhow, he breaks it out of rage, but it cuts to black before that happens because we don't want to have to animate it breaking. We can develop an entire new shader that is glorious to behold. Highly detailed, realistic environments, photorealism, but we draw the line at animating a breaking cup. You can excuse racism. We then see flashes of a mysterious woman enshrouded in a dark fog. I, what was that? Okay, James. Waking up to Iron Mask, you can probably guess what that means, but I'm gonna keep calling him Iron Mask now, just to torture you. Now, dramatic dreams and visions like this are often used in media to foreshadow future events and drip feed information. This is no different. Personally, I don't really mind its function, but it's the backstory later on where I'm probably gonna lose my damn mind. For right now though, th this is fine, this is fine, it's fine. Iron Mask awakens in a mine tunnel where he's greeted by a woman named Tilsa. She is the medical officer for the Crimson Crows, the resident rebel group here in Calaglia, which works against Lord Balsef. Crimson Crows? Don't tell me you've never heard of us. We're the resistance for the Danon people. We get in the way of the Bright Eyes' best laid plans. The Danon resistance? I didn't know such a thing existed. And Iron Mask has never heard of them. I, I get it, he's a newbie, but you would think in a year's time he'd have at least heard the name before? Or that if a masked man like him one day appeared, that they would have heard of him among the Danons that they work for? Or work for? Seems like I know more about you than the other way around, Mr. Iron Mask. Is it true you can't take that thing off? This also leads us into another issue I have with this game. The supporting cast. Ordinarily, Tales games would have a decently sized supporting cast who helped to flesh out the main characters, without stealing the spotlight from them. But in Arise, the supporting cast it does not matter whatsoever. Because of all the realm hopping, there are different minor characters within each realm, and like the villains, none of them get enough time to endear themselves to the player. It makes the world feel even more shallow and lifeless. And on that note, Damn, this game is fast-paced. By this point, I think it's only been like 20 minutes of gameplay, and yet our character has already evaded soldiers, survived a train car explosion, met the leading lady, and encountered the rebellion. That pace seems more akin to a thriller than an RPG that lets you take your time to become fully immersed. Which I suppose was part of the attempt to make this more appealing to mainstream newbies. I can understand that, but I feel like a lot of the aforementioned problems have come from an inability to let the game take its time to set the mood. Also hilarious to me that this game has a breakneck pace and yet did not let us fight some bitches the first chance we had and we still haven't fought anyone. We discover that Xion is currently being held by the Crimson Crows for interrogation. What's going on here? What did she ever- Mind your business. So even if you don't mean to hurt somebody, if they touch you, they get electrocuted, huh? Zephyr clocks her thorns, which cause unrelenting pain to anyone who touches her, whether she wants them to or not. One of the men calls it a great ability, which really sets Shion off as she refers to it as a curse. Still, inflicting pain on anyone who comes near you, that's one hell of an ability. You're wrong. You think this curse is some kind of great ability? <laughs> <laughs> It seems to also act up whenever her emotions become dark and intense, 
In any case, we learn here that she's a Renin, given the fact that she can use astral arts, that her eyes light up when she does so, which earns the Renins the term bright eyes, and that she has a last name. Danins don't have surnames, apparently, so if you got a surname, you're a Renin. Did you really think we wouldn't find out anything about you, Miss Shion Imeris? <laughs> yeah, that's right. This lady's got herself a surname, which means one thing. She's a Renin, our enemy. Yeah, but she was being chased by Renin soldiers. So then why? That's exactly what we're trying to figure out. I assume it's part of the whole lineage thing, which ultimately doesn't even matter, so... Good for you, she of the thousand names. The Crimson Crows are interested in Xion because of all the grief that she's given Balsef. They don't know she has stolen the Master Corps either, so... Yeah, but some fighting words are exchanged, as neither side is particularly happy to see the other. Aside from the clothes they wear, there's only one way to tell a Danon from a Renin, and that's whether their eyes light up or not. Ain't that right, Bright Eyes? Big talk for someone who can't even use astral arts. Embedded. Don't you call us embedded! Side note, I'm realizing now that I make this video and play the game, every Renin has like bright blue eyes, at least the ones I can remember. Balsef, Xion, and Almadria. I'm not sure about Dohalim or Ganabelt. Uh, I guess I'll find out when I get to those parts of the game. But I'm like, wow, they all have the same blue eyes? That's a... Uh... Okay. This also leads to the revelation that Crimson Crow members gouge out their spirit cores from their hands. Look, you see the stone your people embedded in me? There isn't one because we gouged them out the day we swore to rise up against your kind. This scar's a reminder. Not to rest until every last Faith. one of you is- <sighs> Which, yes, is metal, and technically prevents the Renins from stealing their astral energy, but you would think that Renin technology and surveillance would make that more dangerous than it's worth. Especially if that basically identifies you as a rebel immediately. Then again, they left Iron Mask the hell alone for like a year and never even realized he didn't have a core, so maybe they just don't give a fuck. Anyhow, Zephyr shuts down the arguing, less interested in antagonizing Xion, and more in trying to figure out whether she is an ally against Balsef. This is an important detail for later. Zephyr doesn't care whether someone is Danon or Renin, only about whether they are for liberation or against it, or if they're just totally apathetic. Honestly, Zephyr is one of the best characters in the game, and he is easily the highlight of the first few hours. He's a great mentor figure for the young protagonists, and a compelling character in his own right. Funnily enough, he was probably meant to be part of the main cast, given this concept art of said cast. I'll let you guess which one is his silhouette. All I know is Balsef must have his eye on you for a damn good reason. And until we find out why... <laughs> An ambush! <sighs> they must have tracked us down. Right at the worst possible time, Renin's soldiers arrived to attack the mine. Not sure how they found this hideout, nor how they did it so quickly, but the breakneck pace refuses to leave any neck unsnapped. Zephyr heads outside to deal with their guests, leaving his men to escort Xion out, and Iron Mask to just do whatever the fuck he likes, I guess. <clears throat> Enemy attack! An ambush? Renins are here? I have to find an exit and get the hell out of here. It's very odd that, like, they're all splitting up when the mine is literally just one straight, like, hall. Like, it's, like, one corridor. It's, like, a one-way street. And there's, like, one exit. So, like, I, where, why are we splitting up? <laughs> Taking control of Iron Mask again, we must walk in a straight line to our escape. No, literally, the entire mine is just one straight line, which we'll be seeing quite often throughout this game. More on that later when we get out onto the field. Iron Mask runs into a Renin soldier, and it is now we finally get tossed into the throes of battle. Oh, it's just a Danon. You there! Where's the Renin girl who was here? How's this for an answer? Go to hell! You dare address a Renin armored soldier that way! I'll show you embedded! Now, when it comes to gameplay, I really enjoy Arise. It is a clear step up from all the Tales games that came before it, and that includes its real-time combat system, which itself has been a system constantly overhauled and evolved throughout the Tales series. The series has relied upon the Linear Motion Battle System, or LMBS, since Tales of Fantasia, which entails characters battling foes on a 2D plane, with some iterations along the way to modernize it. 
Tales of Arise totally does away with the LMBS. You can move freely around the arena and freely move the camera, just like Tales of Berseria, which, wow, how did it take that long to get there? I played this on the PS4, so I'll be referring to that control scheme. You can use your standard attacks on enemies with the R1 button, which are your basic combos that are free. They don't take up any resources, but there is a limit to how many you can string together, beginning with three. Oh, and you can jump using the circle button, a first for the Tail series. Shocking, I know. Arts, which are akin to spells and special attacks throughout the Tails games, can be mapped to the triangle, square, and X buttons, so you get a bit of customization here. Arts use up the Arts Gauge, or AG, the little blue diamonds near your health bar. You want to use an art? It's going to cost you one to two diamonds. And once it runs out, you have to stop attacking to let it recover. So you can't just spam your moves. Using the same art over and over again will also allow enemies to recover more quickly from your attacks. So none of that either. You can't block an Arise unless you're the shield gal we meet later. Instead, Arise is focused on evasion with the R2 button, so as to keep up the fast-paced tempo of battle. There's also Cure Points, or CP, which recovery and healing arts rely upon. So when you get your healers, they all pull from the same pool. CP and health can both be replenished with items, so you gotta be smart on which resources you use when and why. Especially because in this game, mm, they do not give you a lot of gold. Gold being, you know, money. So if you're trying to buy you some orange gels to replenish your CP, good luck, girl. Insufficient fun. you ain't got no money. Ooh. Honestly, I'm not big on the details of combat systems. All I care about is whether that it's fun to use and feels intuitive, which this system very much is. I really enjoyed Berseria's system and Arises feels like a natural evolution. As for whether it's properly challenging, that I don't really care about since I play games to relax. I was raised on Kingdom Hearts, so my heart is always appreciative of a button masher that you can put more thought into but that also will not punish you if you just want to mindlessly hack and slash some bitches. I will say, a lot of bosses were very annoying even on story mode, which like, what the fuck? There are other difficulty modes that you can install for free, like the very easy mode, uh, which I appreciate. I do miss the little group victory poses after a battle, though. Love fighting with blood objects! Like when you're delivering the finishing blow. Or smashing the enemy's face in. Huh? I'm scared. They always gave you a chance to watch the characters goof around with each other, but Arise cut them for the sake of returning you to the field immediately to keep up the fast pace. I understand that decision, but the dialogue for when they come out of battle is reused so often that it gets grating very quickly. No, Kisara, I don't care if there are no scratches on your shield or armor. Also, this is definitely a nitpick, but why is text in modern games so small? Is it that hard to just allow different font sizes in the settings menu? Something I'm also absolutely in love with is this game's music. The score, like all other Tales games, was composed by Motoi Sakuraba. And genuinely, I fear for this man. He's so over the moon with the series and even admits that he gets fidgety when he's not working on music for a Tales game. <laughs> And I'm over here getting war flashbacks to Jeff and Casey Williams being expected to pump out a whole new soundtrack every year for Ruby. And I'm like, blink twice if you're being held hostage. That said, Tails music is usually hit or miss for me. And on the whole, nothing spectacular. A few themes will stick with me, usually character themes or the tracks for select dungeons. But in Arise's case, the goal of wanting an epic translated into the music where Sakuraba was actually given the chance to work with a full-size live orchestra for the first time. Different tracks were approached with different methods, some with the orchestra, others with a band or in-studio strings, but you can definitely tell that Sakuraba had a field day with this soundtrack. I am no music expert, but Elixir Vitae Games goes into detail about a lot of the tracks, so I'm gonna recommend her video once again. I absolutely love the battle theme here. No! No! It's no! over! I think that's a Spanish guitar going off as Iron Mask does a violence, 
and I love that for him. It especially suits the vibes of Calaglia and the action-focused approach. Meeting up with Xion, Iron Mask helps her against the Renan soldiers. Xion be mayor, I merit Daymor. The mother of dragons, the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea. I hereby detain you in the name of His Excellency Lord Balsam. Damn it, Throw down I was your so weapon. close. <sighs> what the? You've got some kind of death wish? Those are armored soldiers, you're- Shut up and get out of here while you still can! Step aside, slave. These are Renan affairs you're meddling in. We've got a better chance working together. Besides, I don't much feel like being indebted to a Danon. <sighs> Fine, suit yourself. This is the Iron Mask. <laughs> He's king in the north. They aren't keen on working together, yet Iron Mask refuses to let the soldiers capture Xion, and the two work together quite well. What follows is a skit, a brief interaction between characters that's a bit more intimate than the regular cutscenes. Tales games have always used skits to develop the characters and their relationships with each other. It allows them to have some fun, with skits about everything from sad backstories to musings about the world to cooking shenanigans. Jude, you direct tethered with her? Uh, yeah. Muse asked me to. Was that bad? <laughs> bad? It's, uh... Direct tethering is something a spirit and a human do when, uh... uh since we were together constantly, he was able to fill me with loads of mana. I... I had no idea you were that kind of man. The difference here in Arise is the presentation. Traditionally, skits have been presented through 2D portraits, making them relatively easy to arrange compared to cutscenes. You can have hundreds of skits, but if you don't have to animate too much when it comes to portraits, it's feasible. Tales of Zestiria began using full-body 2D renditions, allowing for a bit more life to their movements, and Berseria followed suit. Arise changes this by relying upon the 3D models, framing them in comic book panels with limited animations. The goal here was to prevent immersion breaking from the switch between 2D and 3D. Honestly, I don't dislike the new approach but I'm not particularly fond of it either. The limited animations wind up doing more harm than good and making the characters feel stiff and robotic. I much prefer the old 2D approach, though honestly, my more pressing issue is that the skits in this game just are not as compelling. Many of the skits repeat information and goals we're already well aware of, and they often stack up on top of each other. A lot of times you'll get two to three, even four skits, lined up one after another, all requiring you to play them out in the field. No! Not again! You could simply not play them, but having them linger in the corner, knowing it's a gamble between fun character interactions and dull recaps, instead makes me dread skits when I used to love them. Dispersing the skits probably would have helped. Berseria often played the important skits automatically once you reached certain points of an area, and honestly, I know a lot of people were annoyed with a number of them, but I never found those disruptive. But that might just be because the character interactions in that game were consistently stellar. Perfection, 10 out of 10. I could watch that crew go to the grocery store and be entertained. Mostly because most of them would ransack the store, forcing them to flee from the authorities as Lafayette and Eleanor do their best to mitigate the damage. Forgot to write this in the script, but there's also this running thread where Iron Mask seems to recognize Xion from somewhere, though Xion continually says, no, I've literally never met you before. I've never been to Dana before now. Trust me, I've no great love for Renans. I guess I'm just not as consumed with hatred as some... What? Have we met somewhere before? Me? Friends with a Danon? Can't say I've had the pleasure. You know, it's it's good foreshadowing for Iron Mask's backstory. I'm not a fan of the backstory, but I will admit this is good foreshadowing for it. Once we reach the end of the long, narrow hallway, we reunite with Zephyr and head outside. And once again, it's anime cutscene time. The Renan soldiers surround the only exit, with their goal being to capture Xion and slaughter the Crimson Crows. <laughs> Badly did they want to destroy this hideout. <laughs> Apprehend the traitor! Slaughter the rest! Cue a barrage of arrows because apparently despite having advanced technology, we still default to crossbows? Sure, why not? Look out! 
One of the arrows strikes Xion in the chest. Iron Mask runs to her as a plume of fire bursts from her wound, which is sure to make you go, what the fuck is going on? Iron Mask is able to hold on to Xion and pull the arrow out thanks to his inability to feel pain, and the arrow transforms into a blazing sword. Xion is confused by how Iron Mask pulled this off, and right on cue, the Fire Master Core reveals itself. Somehow, Xion managed to embed it within herself. No, that never gets explained. But it does retroactively explain all the fire, so... Yay? Anyhow, you're welcome for me explaining the Master Cores, because in-game, they expect you to remember them as a throwaway line from the opening monologue. It is ruled over by the tyrant Balsef. Lord of the Fire Master Core. So, you basically don't know what the fuck a Master Core is when it shows up in Xion. Thanks, game. So Iron Mask is able to wield the Blazing Sword, using its flames to incinerate the Renin soldiers in a single Firestorm Slash. <laughs> Again, I can't help but notice that in a moment where the character gets to show off, you again are not able to take control. The game makes you watch as Iron Mask does all the cool stuff while your brain just glazes over. The Blazing Sword actually comes in later as a gameplay mechanic, so I have no clue why it was not introduced here instead of being saved for later. After slaying all of the soldiers, Iron Mask doesn't even notice the ninth degree burns that practically turned his hands into fried chicken nuggets. You okay? Your arms! <clears throat> oh, yeah. How about that? Kinda amusing the way he's so casual about it, realizing that he has such a horrific injury. Oh, yeah. How about that? That's not a dig, I genuinely love this moment. It had me cackling and even more in love with Iron Mask. Someone help this boy. Xion uses her arts to heal him, meaning that she is both the sniper and the healer of this party. A paradox I am absolutely obsessed with. But don't worry, Zephyr will drive home the elevator pitch for you in case you were asleep at the controller. A sword that sears the hand of he who wields it and a healing art to mend. A man numb to pain and a woman whose very touch deals nothing but. Thank you, Catherine Obvious! This game gives me nothing to work with, and yet it will drive home basic ass shit like I'm a toddler. Also, Xion is definitely a perfect match for Iron Mask, given she is completely recovered after being shot in the goddamn chest with an arrow. The wound is gone, and I don't even think she used a healing art for that. Just a flesh wound. Normally I would dock points, but it's actually some pretty solid foreshadowing for her character later in the game. Wish Iron Mask and or Zephyr questioned it a bit more, but that goes for literally everything in this game. As the characters head off, I would just like to briefly touch on the voice acting. The English cast for Tales games have always been strong, and only getting better in recent years. Quite frankly, I tend to prefer the English cast to the Japanese ones, especially for Tales of Berseria. And in general, I'm a dub girly. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Look, I just like being able to hear the characters so that if I look away, I still know what's happening, and I just get more emotionally invested this way. This is just how it is. Arise is no exception. Ray Chase does a wonderful job at capturing Iron Mask's strength and sensitivity. Erica Lindbeck gives Xion the air of a closed off woman who does care deep down, and Patrick Seitz works very well as the mentor figure Zephyr. It is kind of made funnier though, given their roles in previous Tales games. In Patrick's case as the big bad kitty beard from Tales of Zysteria. We're all wanted by the Renans. It'll be easier for everyone if you both just come with me. How brilliant your purity, your innocence. No painter could ask for a more pristine canvas. And for Erica and Ray, some pretty pivotal characters in Berseria. Kinda wild to think that Xion shares a voice with the evil witch Magilu. All I need right now is power. And up until now, 
I haven't come across anything stronger than that blazing sword the whole time I've been doing this. Precisely. The fires of her hatred are all-consuming. Who will they burn in the end? Hmm? And to hear Rey be so emotional as Iron Mask when he did such a good job with portraying Artorius as a cold-hearted bastard. That's insane! You're telling me that's what our people have been dying for this whole time? So Velvet is coming. The ties that bind us must at last be severed. We then make our way to the town of Olzebek through the Sandinus Ravine. I want to take this moment to again praise the presentation of this game, as the environments are absolutely gorgeous. While previous Tales games used in-house engines, this is the first one to be made using Unreal Engine, with a new shader as well called the Atmospheric Shader, or Atmos Shader for short. It took about five years to perfect, so basically the entirety of Arise's development time, and I must say, I am obsessed with the results. Literally, why does this, why does this look so much better than Disney's Wish? Like, oh my god. Normally, I'm not keen on absolute photorealism. I much prefer stylization, where artists are allowed to create unique and varied interpretations of reality. But I think Arise's art style strikes a nice balance for the series. Older Tales games tended to be cell shaded but have been moving in a darker, more watercolor direction since Tales of Zillia. The issue there being that the admittedly lacking graphics, along with the more muted, duller colors, often made the games feel quite dated and muddy, especially awkward with the janky ass motion capture animations. But Arise is utterly breathtaking. I love all the environments this game has to offer, and the character models are pretty stunning themselves. There's so much vibrant color and so much detail in the different materials of the characters' clothing and the environments that this feels like a natural evolution of the series' art style. It's a culmination of all that came before it into something truly beautiful. The stiff animations, especially in skits, can put a damper on things, along with the wonky lip syncing, but for the most part, I absolutely love how Arise looks. That's not to mention the little quality of life improvements that have come a long way, such as letting characters jump in the environment and even swim. <laughs> I don't think they were as well integrated as they could have been, not saying this needed to become a platformer, but some experimentation with field movement would have been nice for level design. Oh, also really appreciate the dedicated sprint button with no stamina meter. God, I needed that desperately in Berseria, and especially Zestiria. Windstepping can kiss my ass, that's, that's what I'll tell you. That all said, the hallway problem returns. Sandinus Ravine, like 90% of all the fields and other environments, is basically a jaunt from point A to point B. Arise is not an open world game, and Tomizawa stated this in development. And honestly, I am grateful that it isn't, because then the environments would have likely felt incredibly overwhelming. Zysteria attempted an open world-esque approach. Despite environments still being linear when strung together, they were vast with a whole lot of nothing as you slowly trekked across the continent. Not to mention, it's a huge time and money sink for developers. For that discussion, I recommend Noodle's video, Why Games Are Too Damn Big. I added damn for emphasis. That said, all of the environments being these aggressively linear corridors adds to the issue of this world feeling lifeless. Having some interconnectivity could have helped a little bit. Admittedly, this has been an issue since Tales of Zillia. Before then, Tales games would let you traverse the world map as an overworld, with towns and dungeons represented by field icons. To make travel easier, you would have access to boats as well as an airship, usually by the end of the game to give you that sense of progression and achievement. They'd even take away these methods of travel for when the characters were in dire straits story-wise. But since Zillia, fields have replaced the overworld, and for the most part, they've been generic roads and trails connecting more interesting areas. The most you'll get is occasional snow, some unique looking trees, uh, the varying shades of green and blue and dirt. Arise's areas are a bit better with more personality without feeling barren like the areas from Zysteria but that sense of restriction is still there. Along the way, we get a glimpse of Balsef's fortress, Glanamede Castle. Before it stands the Gates of Fire, the wall which seals Calaglia off from the neighboring realms. That's... Glanamede Castle, stronghold of Lord Balsef, self-imposed ruler of all Calaglia. I've never seen it from this close before. That's it, all right. 
and next to it are the Gates of Fire. Take a good long look while you still can. That wall is what we've come to tear down. The only thing standing between us and freedom. I mention this because while it does help with Balsap's presence just a tad to see his castle off in the distance, that fact is overshadowed by my confusion as to where the hell everything is geographically. Ordinarily in a Tales game, you would get a world map to see how all the different areas connect to each other. In Arise, there is no map, unless you count the one from the opening monologue. All you get is a list of locations you can fast travel to with no in-game explanation of how you're teleporting everywhere. This further breaks immersion because without the ability to tell where we are on the continent, you lose any sense of existing within a much larger fantasy world. Seriously, was this just an oversight or something? The load times aren't too bad, thankfully, but something I find strange is the little world building notes explaining different areas, characters, or concepts. Oftentimes when I do try to read them, the next area has loaded before I have finished, but that's not really my grievance. It's more that I find it a strange approach given I'm not sure why you'd need this constant reminding of random concepts or plot points, especially in this seemingly random manner. Legit, like I was in the final act of the game and I was still getting reminders of who characters from the first few hours were, and then other cards reminding you that they had passed away. And I'm like, um, thank you for reminding me of that event from 40 hours ago. We come across a little campfire, not sure who started it, nor why this roaming salesman is just standing here menacingly. He's just standing there. But I'm sure he won't mind if we just chill here. Please don't kill us in the night. Anyhow, camping is a mechanic I really do enjoy in this game. They allow you to rest out in the field, giving you a chance to listen to some character banter, play some skits, cook for some stat boosts, and even have conversations with the party members before bed to become closer with them. It's on this night we get even more exposition yeeted Iron Mask's way, praise be to the amnesia trope. Oh, right, you don't remember a damn thing, do you? They're harvesting the astral energy that sleeps inside all matter in life. They have machines for minerals. And they're doing it the same way they have for the past 300 the years. That's insane! Zephyr and Shion explain the gathering of astral energy, the spirit vessels and master cores, and the crown contest. Really not sure why those things were not given out up front, but okay, sure, why not? The real new information here is Shion's goal to take down all of the lords. I'm going to take down all of the lords. Why? Why not? <laughs> why though? She won't say why, but it's clear that she is determined to achieve her goal at any cost, even if it means fighting her fellow Renans. That said, while we will discover why, we don't know how she got to Dana, nor what her life was like back on Lenigus. So all the things that could paint the context of her situation, thus giving us a better picture of who she is, Nah, nah, bitch, make up your own. This is the Miles and Carrie school of writing tropes, fam. There's no escape. In any case, we're all allies in the struggle against Balsef. And so Iron Mask decides to join the Crimson Crows, while Shion tags along, as the Blazing Sword won't work without her present, and Iron Mask is the only one who can actually wield it. It's kind of wild how passionate Iron Mask is about this mission, given how strangely oblivious he is to the way the world has been for like a year now. Honestly, I'm still a little confused by all this. But if it's a choice between this or going back to being a slave, then I choose to fight. But maybe that's just the himbo energy talking. Shion also has an ominous dream, proving she is indeed Iron Mask's soulmate. Except instead of a weird lady saying random things, it's thorns. Lots and lots of thorns. What was that? Okay, James. I've gotta hurry. There's some sort of energy trying to break free through the thorns, with the thorns keeping it held back. And when Shion awakens, she says that she has to hurry. There's clearly more to her mission and to her curse of thorns than meets the eye. Yay, foreshadowing. Finally arriving in Olzebek, I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the design of the towns in this game. While they might be part of the linear corridor design, where the entire world is just one giant loop, I really appreciate how much effort was put into making the towns distinct and bustling. Walking through towns in this game is the closest I ever feel 
to believing that Dana is a living, breathing world. Calaglia's towns are much humbler than those of the other realms, but I appreciate the crude architecture and stairways, along with the tiny animal pens and gardens off to the side. We meet up with the rest of the Crimson Crows, where Zephyr is determined to take down Balsef once and for all now that Iron Mask and Shion are aboard. Which... Wow, we just met the man and he's already entrusting us with helping him overthrow the government. So we're finally going head to head with Balsef. That's right. We can't afford to mess this up. It's now or never. Can we at least go out to dinner beforehand first? Again, breakneck pace is quite alarming. Moreover, Zephyr does this planning off screen for a while, leaving Iron Mask and Shion to fuck around doing random errands unrelated to what's actually going on in the plot. Leave the plan to me. In the meantime... Yeah, you two need to do something about your outfits. Don't be fucking Don't do rude. Are you kidding me? I much would have preferred taking time to set up this mission to take down Balsef. If you've ever played the Sly Cooper games, the later ones have an episodic structure, kind of similar to Arise's approach with the different realms. Each episode has the characters doing reconnaissance, followed by several smaller jobs they work to set up the final heist at the end, where they take down the big bad of that episode. First, Sly will have to pick a few pockets in the theater so that we'll have access to the Spotlight Control Center. Once that's accomplished, we'll be able to turn off all the security around the printing press. I much would have preferred something like that here, to help make it feel like the characters are actively working against the Renan Lords while also helping to further reinforce the Lord's presence and influence over their realms. Anyhow, Iron Mask gets a new look because he gets 500 new looks through this game. It's not one he'll have for long, but it works. I kind of like the blacksmith gloves since, you know, he's a huge weapons nerd. Is this something you're into? Yeah, these ingenious structures and gadgets never cease to amaze me. Check out these handle grooves. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be seeing here. Honestly, it's the little quirks of the characters that really endear me to them, rather than the big dramatic moments that they try to give them. You can always count on Tales games to have these weird, relatable touches to their characters. With that, we talk to Dairon, who sends us on some quests to help out the Crimson Crows that, truth be told, I wasn't really invested in. Yes, it was an attempt to drive home the stakes of being part of a rebellion, but... Perhaps that could have been done in a way that was more plot relevant. A cooking pot? If I had to guess, he put it there to make sure a Renan wouldn't steal it. I guess you think it's stupid getting killed over a silly trinket, huh? No. Clearly he risked his life for something he believed in. I would never mock someone for that. However, it will be up to us to figure out the purpose behind his dying act. Really, this is all about introducing you to the concept of subquests. Tales games always include these to let you take a breather from the main plot for a while, and they usually also give you more insight into the characters. Not the case here in Arise. Occasionally, you will get cute character interactions, since most subquests involve cutscenes where characters are paired off, but it's not quite on the level of subquests from previous games. That said, I very much appreciate the event list that keeps track of all the main quests and subquests. It is a lifesaver, alongside the little envelopes in the quote unquote map menu to show you where you can accept new subquests. What's strange though is that most subquests aren't voiced. It's just text with occasional lines from characters like yeah or Hmm, or a very awkward, disturbing laugh. Hey. Yes! <sighs> hmm. <laughs> in a game that tries to make itself more grand in terms of presentation, it's so jarring to not have voices in this one aspect, especially when everything else in the game is voiced. Like, literally everything else. <laughs> As you complete subquests, you'll receive Gauld, the currency for all Tales games, along with skill points aka SP. Each game has a unique way to gain new abilities and arts for characters, and in Arise it's through the skill panel. By continuing through the story, completing certain subquests, or achieving certain tasks, you'll unlock new titles, or emblems. Each title comes with five potential arts or abilities you can unlock for a certain amount of SP. It's a simple and effective way to encourage players to partake in subquests, rewarding them with things that'll make the battles easier, and I am here for it. There's also weapons forging, which I'm with Xion, I do not care about this. 
but good for you, Iron Mask. I, I'm happy for you. It's actually super cute how into weapons Iron Mask is. Like, it's so adorable the way he gets excited about things that can kill monsters. So different materials produce different weapons, each with their own respective properties. We should probably move on. Come to think of it, what's my sword made of? What material would it make sense with? Claws? Fangs? In one ear and out the other. Inns are also present, just like previous games, but to be honest, I never stay at them unless it's part of the main story. Camping usually winds up being more convenient, funnily enough. Plus, it's free and it gives you the opportunity to let your characters interact with each other. So, to hell with inns, I say. Oh, one other type of subquest I should mention are the gigant zoogles. That's giant with an extra G, so you know it's extra giant. Extra gigant. You see that big freaky looking monster up on the cliff? That is one enormous stray. I don't think we can take it right now. Do not mess with it or you will get slaughtered and probably deserve it. These high level zoogles are found throughout the world. Defeat them and you'll get plenty of rewards for your troubles and complete certain subquests while you're at it too. Not to mention an astral flower, which raises your CP by 10 points. What really irks me about them though, is that the game does not tell you what your recommended level should be beforehand. Lots of times I would get trapped into a gigant zoogle or boss fight in a subquest where I was significantly underleveled. And uh, your only option there is to just die since you can't escape from these fights either. The game will just send you right back to the field in shame, but still annoying. Reset! This can't be happening! 12 seconds later. Not good enough! Well, for the gigant zoogles, they'll send you back to the field. Uh, if you die to a boss, though, your only options are to either restart the fight immediately or load your last autosave and pray. One of our missions involves getting some new threads for Xion, cause she's a diva. She's not exactly happy at the idea of donning a Danon outfit, and so we're told we might find some in the nearby Fagin ruins. And Xion is very insistent upon this. How'd you figure a place like this turns derelict? Your guess is as good as mine. I didn't even know this place existed until we heard about it. All that matters to me is whether I can find anything to wear in there. Why does she care so much about her appearance? One of Xion's quirks is that she's an absolute style diva and a fashionista in the same vein as my sun and moon queen Stella. Last year, she destroyed the potions laboratory with an unauthorized magic spell. You really did that? I was trying to create a new shade of pink. There's a subquest that even involves her giving fashion advice to some loser in town who takes the entire game to pick an outfit, only for Xion to go, what the fuck are you wearing, you loser? It's great, 10 out of 10. She is the Gordon Ramsay of fashion, but with less pretension. I'm just disgusted that you're standing there smirking away. Would you like some popcorn? She also notes how Iron Mask doesn't really pay much mind to how he looks. What are you staring at me for? Your clothes are all about function over form. You should think about sprucing them up a little. Why? What purpose would it serve? I guess you're right. I just think you'd look good with a little blue thrown in somewhere. Hmm. All right, I'll think about it. And you select, I don't know, that lumpy blue sweater because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back. But what you don't know is that that sweater is not just blue. It's not turquoise. It's not lapis. It's actually cerulean. She is entirely correct. Blue is his color. It's just so cute. And this little note will come back later in their interactions. And it's some of the most wholesome content I've ever seen. I'm not gonna lie, I care more about this than the main plot. Along the way, we're introduced to boost strikes. The little character gauges in the corner have meters running around them. Once they're full, you can press one of the directional buttons to use that character's boost strike, a unique move that'll do some extra damage to enemies, or have a unique effect based on that character's playstyle. Iron Masks is a quick slash from the Blazing Sword, while Xion's is a barrage from her gun that's particularly useful against flying enemies. You can even use boost strikes for characters who aren't actively in the party, which makes it feel like all the characters get to be present in battle. As we approach the next campfire, well, the game does it for us. Your field character just seemingly gets possessed by the plot as they force you to slowly march towards the flames. Not sure why they didn't just cut to black and have you camp or just let you walk there yourself, especially when this game has already shown issues when it comes to letting the player have agency. 
In any case, we learn about cooking here. It's not a mini game, but rather something you select from a menu whenever you camp out, with different foods awarding you certain stat boosts in battle, and the occasional skit depending on the food and who cooks it. Fun fact, Iron Mask loves spicy foods because he can't feel pain. Well, one time I couldn't get enough of these things I picked off a plant. Everyone else said they were way too spicy. Doc thinks maybe I crave spicy food to compensate for the lack of pain I feel. He adds enough spice to hospitalize a whole room of people. But for him, it's never spicy enough. I, I love him. I love him so much. Iron Mask writes. Iron Mask writes! The Fagin Ruins actually do a pretty good job at reinforcing the sci-fi elements of this story. We don't know its full history, but Xion believes it could have been a supply depot, or even the castle of a former Renan Lord. So it's entirely possible that this place used to be both a supply depot and a Lord's castle at different points in time. The material of the ruins is indestructible to conventional Danon means. No, we don't learn what that material is, by the by. But the door opens for Xion because she's a Renan. Apparently that, that's enough to get in here. The Renans build their structures out of special materials too. Strong enough to withstand assaults from Danon tools and weaponry, anyway. So how the hell are we? Easy. <sighs> it's kind of wild that this ancient ruin has more security than the castles of current Renan lords in their cities. But I digress. We also learned that while many Zoogles do directly serve the Renans, there are also stray Zoogles out in the wild, threatening pretty much anything they encounter. As it turns out, many Zoogles were actually created by the Renans, genetically modifying the native animals of Dana. Wasn't it you Renans who brought the Zoogles here from Rena in the first place? They're not just ordinary animals from Rena. Each of them has been modified to suit a particular purpose. In fact, some Zoogles were originally derived from the animals on Dana, or so I've heard. What? You Renans couldn't stop at just the people of this planet? You had to screw with our nature too? It shows the cruelty of Renans in not only trying to control and threaten the Danans, but also their disrespect for anything native to Dana, including their own wildlife, goes hand in hand with eradicating Danan culture and history. Deeper inside, we uncover what seems to be the wardrobe of the ruins' late owner. Xion mentions the designs are pretty dated, but she's happy to have something other than the basic dress we first met her in. When she finally shows off the look, she does so in style. Listen, I get it. You care how you look. But we've got places to... What is it? N no, I... Uh, nothing. You are having a heterosexual moment, my dude. Congratulations, you're a breeder. I am obsessed with this design. No, a dress like this is probably not very practical, but honestly, I don't care. I don't give a fuck. It is so utterly fabulous while also communicating different aspects of Xion's character. So much so that I am on board for this look. It has a similar issue to the Renan soldier's armor where it communicates more of a fantasy vibe than a sci-fi one, but you know, it's, it's too late. Recurring themes and all that. I absolutely love the silhouette for her look and how regal she feels. The little bits of armor, especially in the shape of the thorns, communicate her trying to protect herself, along with how her curse of thorns has consumed such a large part of her identity. The pops of red in her tiara, the ribbons on her arms, and in her dress give her this bold energy that suits her determination and attitude. And the fact she keeps bullets on a thigh strap? Style icon who's also ready to kick ass, we must stand. I also really like Xion's concept art. Funnily enough, it does a lot more in evoking sci-fi vibes than her final design, though it gives her more of a rough and tumble vibe than the regal one she wound up with. I still prefer her final design, but I'm fascinated by all the concept art for this game's cast. Personally, I would have loved to see the concept art turned into unlockable costumes, but We'll get to the problem of the wardrobe customization later. It's actually really cute how excited Xion gets when she's in this new outfit, yet she tries to play it off when Iron Mask comments on it. Okay, let's head back to Ulzebek. You're in a good mood. Were you that happy to find a new outfit? 
I don't know what you're talking about. I'm the same as ever. They may be very moody at the start, but there are glimmers of these two's connection from the start, and I love them so much. When we return to Olzebek, we hear word from Zephyr that there's chaos unfolding back over in Mosgul. Apparently, the Renan soldiers are culling the Danan slaves, looking for Shion so they can take back the Master Corps, which is an odd way to go about things, and also strange that their search would be in the town we just left, and not Olzebek. You know, the larger town just down the road. We also learn this from a non-voiced cutscene, by the by, so... Yeah, this one is just not hitting me with much gravity. No way! Damn it! Iron Mask is immediately worried about Doc, Cole, and the other Danins of Mosgul. Shion tries to talk him down, but Iron Mask refuses to let the Renans cause any more suffering. Just where do you think you're going? You know where. Mosgul. What good is it going to do to- I don't need your permission! <sighs> I actually love seeing this fiery protective energy from Iron Mask, and this is probably his most defined trait. It is a bit anticlimactic with no actual cutscene showcasing what the soldiers are doing, instead giving us a lot of non-voiced, awkwardly stiff clips. Now you'll learn! <laughs> Mess with my friends, will you? You just crossed the wrong line! Along with Iron Mask yelling, I can't reach them in time, when he hears Doc in danger. And then he does, in fact, reach them in time. Please, don't hurt the children. What's that? Damn it, I can't reach them in time! Twelve seconds later. Get back, Cole! Doc! Cole! Stop! So, don't know what that was about. Awkwardness aside, we then get some conflict between Iron Mask and Doc. Doc is focused on just getting back to normal and keeping his head down. He believes that by not rocking the boat, the Danans will survive another day, and he perceives the Crimson Crows as provoking the Renans into violence. But Iron Mask calls that out, saying the truth that the Renans will inflict violence upon the Danans regardless. He would rather die fighting for freedom than die giving up. You're dead if you stand up to them. Keep your head down and do as you're told. At least then you have a chance to survive. You're willing to risk everything on the chance that things will get better if we wait long enough. But what's the point of waiting if others have to die so that we can live? What do you think happens when someone tries to resist? It'd be one thing if the rebel died and that was that. But it never ends with only one death. You've seen it for yourself. Everyone suffers for it. Knowing that, are you really going to tell me our waiting has no meaning? But that's... I understand not wanting to throw away the same lives we're trying to protect. That would be senseless. But if you wait too long, if you get too used to waiting, then eventually you lose the will to fight. I don't want that to happen to me. You know, I feel like certain characters in a show about girls with colors could really stand to watch this. It is a nice moment to show off the passion of Iron Mask's character, but it's also so strange again because of the fast pace. He went from not understanding so much of the world that he's inhabited for like a year to suddenly having these fierce, unshaking beliefs. Even Doc acknowledges how much Iron Mask has grown and changed. You've grown so much since we first met. And you've met some good people too. Maybe you have a chance after all. And I'm like, fam, it's been like, what, an hour, an hour and a half of gameplay? What? With all that out of the way, it's time to get down to business. You know, overthrowing the government and assassinating Lord Ball Sniffer. You know, for funsies. Yes, that is cursed, and no, I will not apologize. You're not gonna ask what happened? I can tell enough by the way you look right now. I see. The plan is simple. Zephyr and the other Crimson Crows will distract the Renan soldiers guarding the front gates of Glanamede Castle. Iron Mask and Shion, meanwhile, will enter the castle through a maintenance route and take down Balsif themselves. The plan is... Frightfully simple? Again, because we've been spending the last hour or so just doing random quests and objectives unrelated to the plot with Balsef, there isn't enough buildup to let this mission carry the necessary weight that ought to come with such a big undertaking. No, this isn't a stealth game, but I kind of would expect more from characters trying to overthrow an oppressive regime. Zephyr and the Crimson Crows are supposed to be distracting the Renans from the front. Then let's go around and sneak in elsewhere. <laughs> That's Zephyr from the Crimson Crows! 
Kill him! And for said regime to have more security than that of an abandoned desert ruin. We should be getting close to the service entrance. Good. Let's get in there and kick their asses. Is this someone's idea of a bridge? Looks like it. Don't fall or this will be a pretty short story. Breaking into Yon Castle, we're finally able to wield the Blazing Sword in battle. You should take the Blazing Sword. I took the liberty of cutting the flow of energy from the Master Core. I may be giving you the sword, but you still need me to unleash its power. Try not to forget that. When holding down the button for certain arts, Iron Mask is able to unleash a higher level Flaming Edge move, which uses the power of the Blazing Sword to scorch enemies to a crisp. Doing so will shave off a bit of his HP, so there's a considerable cost that keeps you from spamming it to hell. But thankfully, Xion's there in case you need some healing. It's nice because it reinforces their dependence upon each other through gameplay so you feel what he feels. I really like that. Kinda wish we got access to this earlier, but what can you do? In addition, we also now have access to boost strike finishing moves. You see the little diamond with the blue gauge over the enemy? Once it's filled, you can unleash a team attack to finish them off. Do it! Off, chill. This ends now! Consider yourself finished! They're similar to the Link Arts from Tales of Zillia, except in this case, each pair will have the same boost strike throughout the entire game. I do enjoy them, and again, it allows all the characters to feel involved in battle, but that said, having them repeat the same attack over and over really numbs the mind. They also don't take up any resources, but that personally doesn't really bother me given it's more a reward for sustained combos as you weaken and eventually finish off the enemy. There's also a lot of spontaneous combustion in this castle, because of course there is. When you're navigating the environment, certain paths will be blocked off by different obstacles, requiring you to use your CP to clear the way. Again, there is a good cost-reward balance here. You want whatever's in that chest over there, or those totally legal herbs? You gotta pay for it, bitch. Though be sure to check the map before you do this, because sometimes all you have to do is walk around the fire instead of through it. Sneaky game. Also, as it turns out, fire created by astral energy, like pure astral energy, doesn't need a source to burn. Cool. Would have been nice to know that beforehand, with all the fire raging outside for no fucking reason. I feel like this game is just the definition of show you a thing and then justify it afterwards. Establishing beforehand? <laughs> Never. Never. Unfortunately, this castle is another run in a straight line, except in this case, it involves a lot of stairs as you search for elevator keys. The design of Glanemy Castle is pretty simple. The floor plans are just big circles of rocks with a flaming hell pit in the middle. You know, casual Calaglian decor. There are comments on how this castle was made to suit Balsef's personal tastes, given he's supposed to be this boorish brute with no sense of style or class, which Xion finds disgusting as a Renin. Nothing but fire and rocks. I figured a Renan castle would at least be a little more elegant. Instead, it seems this one was very dedicated to a theme. Is that your idea of a joke? Don't lump the rest of us in with someone like Balsef. Then why does his place look so grungy? I guess you could say that's just the majority of what he's into. He likes fire, and he likes rocks. He's an egotistical brute without a single shred of class. It's a nice attempt at characterization and culture, but it's not enough to make up for Balsef's utter lack of presence and depth. Along the way, we save a small servant child from some Renan guards. What were you even doing here? Dan and slaves that can't handle manual labor outdoors are put to work in the castles as servants. I'm surprised you didn't know. He's thankful to Xion, though Xion tries to shoo him away, afraid of hurting him with her thorns if he gets too close. And it's good that we found you, but it's still not safe here. You need to get out of here before any more soldiers find you. Understand? Yes, ma'am. Thanks for saving me. Oh, here, you can have this. Don't touch me. Uh, I'm sorry. I only wanted to, to... Oh my God. I can't. Get out. Though, Iron Mask doesn't seem to catch on to this. Not too happy about a slave touching you, huh? So even if you don't mean to hurt somebody, if they touch you, they get electric. This isn't the time. We should keep moving. You think this curse is some kind of great ability? 
fucking idiot. Really rude, dude. I, I can't tell if he realizes he completely misread that because of the damn mask, but like, seriously, what the fuck, man? I will say, I do like these subtle touches to Xion that she does genuinely care for people. We will see this recur throughout the game, but despite her cold demeanor, she really is quite thoughtful. She does this to keep people away because of her curse of thorns. You're too close. Try to stay farther apart. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Was I really that close? I guess I'm just not used to standing right next to people. <sighs> you mean because of your thorns? <sighs> You're a surprisingly nice person. What? You don't think so? I mean, you just made sure your thorns wouldn't. You can keep your opinions to yourself. You don't know the first thing about me. I'll be diving into this angle much, much later in this game, when we learn the full truth about the curse, but suffice to say, I am very much a fan of Xion's complexity. Honestly, it makes her my favorite character in the game. I hate when I feel like people are laughing at me on the inside, especially someone like you where I can't read your expression. Why would I laugh at you? What are you talking about? My outfit. As soon as you saw me in those ruins, you wanted to say something, didn't you? Oh, it's not that. It's just... Just what? N nothing You're a truly awful person. You know that? An awful... Hey, you're the one jumping to conclusions about what I think. You're not one to talk. Then prove me wrong and tell me what you were really thinking. It wasn't anything mean about you, I promise. I don't believe that for a second. And it doesn't matter what the hell I tell you. You'll always doubt me. <laughs> Arriving outside the throne room, we find a recovery circle that will restore our health and CP, along with a little warning about a fight with a Renan Lord awaiting on the other side of the doors. As a girly who plays games to relax, I very much appreciate these. They let you go into the boss knowing what you're getting yourself into, and going in fully prepared and revitalized. I can see how people wanting more of a challenge would be annoyed by this, but... You could just not use the circle. That option is there too, you know. I'm here for story, okay? Just let me bun mash to my heart's content. Now, I would say we face off with Balsef at long last, but given the lack of build-up to this moment, it's more of a... Yeah, let's just do this, I guess. Don't move, Balsef! Try me, bitch. There's no real excitement to face off with him, given he's had little to no presence so far, and has no real connection to either Iron Mask or Xion. Even beforehand, we get a skit where Xion tries to tell us a bit about Balsef, but it's more about his physical abilities than his actual character. Iron Mask apparently doesn't even think much of Balsef, referring to him as just the Lord of Calaglia. He's just a lord that holds power over Calaglia, isn't he? Just a lord? He is far more than that. Balsef Erwolzi Teldilis is one of the five lords that sit atop all of Renan society. So he doesn't even really seem particularly interested in Balsef as an antagonist. We have no idea as to who Balsef is as a character, nor why he has been so dedicated to the crown contest, aside from the generic goal of become sovereign. And unfortunately, that means he's not very engaging, nor is he bringing out interesting sides to our protagonists. It's just... Kill this boring man's progress the plot, please. He functions well enough as a first villain, but in addition to not having much in the way of character, he's also just very dull on screen. So the vermin scum you call kin stirred up enough trouble for you two rats to make it all the way to me, huh? huh. What a pain in the ass. It was pretty impressive of you to deliver it straight into my hands. The Master Core. You really think we're here to hand it over? <laughs> Why, of course not. You see, I'll be taking it back no matter what you say. He's supposed to be this violent brute, but his dialogue is not very different from what you'd expect from a run-of-the-mill big bad going on and on about how he's gonna kill the protagonists. In any case, this is the end for you. You won't be getting out of here alive. <laughs> You were fools for coming here! Now die! No thanks. I choose my own destiny. We also learn later on in the game that he's apparently very dedicated to his family, House Teldillis. He's described as this caring, protective patriarch, 
and none of that is even suggested in our encounters with him, or even in his conversation with Gannabelle, so it fails to make him intimidating, engaging, and complex. Oh goody. Following the first half of the fight, half of Iron Mask's, well, mask breaks. Alfin. 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 <gasps> Iron Mask! As it shatters, he sees flashes of the mysterious woman from earlier, and we finally see his face. And he is pretty. Oh no, he's hot! Iron Mask really be giving silver-haired himbo energy, and I love that for him. You know, with the hair and skin tone, he's kind of giving Xehanort, but with Sora's sweet, innocent soul. And I'm here for that. And also, that kind of gets rid of the weird colorism from Kingdom Hearts, so... That's good. Kingdom Hearts girlies, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's no time to comment on it as Balsef retreats to the castle roof, but I do wonder why it happened here? It's probably just to give Balsef a moment to move the fight to the roof as the protagonist pause, you know, to make it more cinematic and dramatic. But part of me feels it might have been better to hold off until a more epic moment after the second half of the fight to do the mask thing. But. This, this is fine, I suppose. This is fine. Anyhow, we continue to the roof so we can have a properly cinematic face-off. Unless you can see all of the realm that you're fighting for, with the threat of a several thousand foot drop into the surrounding hell pits, is it even an important battle? Running from a slave, Balsif? Know your place, insolent boy. Up here, I've got more than enough space to crush you. This time your mask won't be the only thing that cracks. That is enough! Oh my God. And naturally, to make it even more epic, we have invited this giant fire monster to the party. Balsif has no clue what the fuck this thing is, but Xion comments that it's living, manifested astral energy, likely from the spirit vessel. It's manifested astral energy. Not only that, it's alive! Now, this game is not going to explain any of this concept to you until very late in the game, 30 to 35 hours in. So I'm just gonna go ahead and explain it for you now. You're welcome. When enough astral energy gathers in one place, it gains sentience and becomes a living spirit. The master cores prevent this, but presumably because Xion has been holding on to the damn thing, there's been nothing to keep the astral energy in the spirit vessel here from coming to life. Very appreciative that it waited until just now to gain sentience and turn into a giant fire monster. I, I really like that. What the hell is that thing? A spirit vessel. It's what the Renans use to harvest astral energy from Danans. So that's where it all ends up, huh? Now, while this concept is gonna come back, it will not be back until the end of the game. This does not happen with any of the other Renan lords. The actual reason for this is that they wanted this battle with Balsef to be just as grand as the final battle, which... I mean, I respect, but also why? But continuing a strange trend, you don't actually fight the monster, but more just try to avoid it while you fight Balsef. And for me, that just kind of takes the fun out of facing off with this thing. I mean, there's like a couple weird reaction command-esque moments with Alfin fighting the monster, but like nothing on the level of the reaction commands from Kingdom Hearts 2. That shit was glorious. Balsef also makes a comment all, it was the two of you. I knew it all along. Astral energy from the spirit vessel? But wait. That was harvested for me, and that energy is supposed to be mine! It was the two of you! I knew it all along, and you'll pay! As in that they were taking the astral energy that he was harvesting for the crown contest, which... Didn't he already know that? It was the two of you! I knew it all along! Flashback. It was pretty impressive of you to deliver it straight into my hands. The Master Core. End of flashback. And you'll pay! The whole reason he was after Xion was because she took his master core. He even reminded us that he knew that just before we came up here. So why is he acting brand new? 
I guess he took some notes from Iron Mask. I'm surprised you didn't know. Something I do really enjoy is Balsef's disgust towards Xion. He is personally offended by Xion's betrayal of the Renans, questioning why she's so willing to destroy what her people have built, while also wearing his disdain for Danans on his sleeve. Do you not possess the blood of a Renan? Why then would you turn against your own kind? It's always been the way of the Renan for the strongest to survive! And yet, you have allied yourself with a filthy Danan! You traitor! <coughs> Tell me why! Why bring ruin and devastation to your own kind? Snakes like you should die! I, <laughs> I, I meant sleeve, but in the script I wrote on his slave, which, uh, I mean, given the plot of the game, I guess, okay. Tell me why! Tell me why! It's the closest to true characterization that we get for Balsef and also gives us an inkling as to the delusive superiority Renans pride themselves on. What would have made it better is if we knew more about Balsef's personal take on this. It feels more like a statement made on behalf of all Renans rather than something personally tailored to him. Again, we don't know much about Balsef or Xion's pasts on Lenigus. What if they knew each other somehow back on Lenigus, or once crossed paths? A pre-existing relationship that has been turned on its head by Xion's goal of defeating the Renan lords, adding to Balsef's feelings of betrayal and revulsion, while also emphasizing just how far Xion is willing to go to achieve her goal, and begging the question of, why? She may be doing the right thing by helping the Danans, but there is a selfish motivation behind it that we're left in the dark on. I just find it such a compelling angle that I wish they did more with. A lot of these things honestly feel like a first or second draft rather than the final polished script. In his fury, Balsef lunges to kill Xion. Iron Mask defends her, which gives me life, and yeets Balsef thusly right into the fire monster's gullet. Well, right into his hand, and I assume that the monster would eat him if it had the chance. A fitting end for a villain the game quickly forgets about. Also gives our protagonists plausible deniability, so that they can say they took down the Renan Lord, but, you know, they didn't really directly kill him. Because protagonists can never be allowed to do that. Even though it's a theme that we've tackled in previous games like Tales of the Abyss. To kill someone means to rob them of their future, even if it is to protect yourself. And it can earn you the hatred of others. Are you prepared to deal with that? Can you face that responsibility without running away? Without making excuses? You said yourself, you aren't killing people because you want to. I've made up my mind. I'm not here just to be a burden. I'm going to take responsibility too. And it's kind of inevitable when you're overthrowing oppressive regimes and systems. And yes, that will be relevant later. Somehow, Iron Mask gets the idea to absorb the fire monster into the blazing sword. My interpretation is that because the sword is connected to the master core and the monster is made out of astral energy, that allows the sword to absorb the energy that composes the monster. But again, that's just kind of me doing a lot of the legwork when the game has not really made this process very clear. So it feels like Iron Mask just knows what to do because the script said so. I guess you could connect it to the way he also absorbed fire in the palace, but like, it feels tenuous at best. Especially when a lot of other things in the story have not been really set up all that well or just left to your imagination. Forgive me if I don't have very much trust in anything else when it comes to world building. So he absorbs the monster into the sword and then releases all of that fire to destroy the gates of fire essentially allowing a way out of Calaglia now. It is an epic moment, definitely, and one I don't mind being portrayed in a cutscene given it's not a battle. Weird it's not an anime cutscene now that I'm thinking about it, though. Man, they probably wanted to show off the graphics. As Xion heals him, the sun rises, which I absolutely love for this moment. I'm a sucker for a good sunrise. Along with the triumphant music. Xion now realizes that part of the mask broke off, given... You know, they were a little bit busy fending for their lives a few moments ago, so I will allow this. But now, Iron Mask remembers his name. He stands tall and screams his name out for all to hear. We brought down the wall! Uh, uh, Iron Mask, your face is exposed! No. Huh? I 
I remember it now. My name. <sighs> Alfin. My name is. Alfin! And you know what? Good for Alfin. My boy is nothing if not dramatic and dumb. Though again, another awkward fade to black kinda just kills the momentum, making it feel less iconic and more, you thought you ate, but he tried. And that's what matters. I want to be your girl right now. You are the place my only.